Bohr model calculations. Here's a quick tour through Bohr's mathematics. Just, this is just to illustrate how some very simple algebra can get to a very interesting solution. You're not going to be responsible for this. Why? Because we're talking about angular momentum. Angular momentum is L, and basically it's linear momentum, right? We always called that P, just times the distance from the nucleus to the electron orbitals or levels. So the quantized angular momentum of each level is expressed as mv times r sub n, where n is the number of the energy level, can go from 1, 2, 3. So that's equal to n times h over 2 pi. Again, don't worry about that. The Coulomb attractive force between the nucleus of charge ZE and the single electron that provides a centripetal force, remember, Bohr was only calculating the orbits for atoms with a single electron. So here's Coulomb's law, and we're just taking the magnitude of that. So that's going to be k z e squared over r sub n squared. And what does that equal? You're going in a circle, so it's good old centripetal acceleration, mv squared over r. Combining these two equations, doing a little algebra, and solving for the radius of each quantum level, we get this expression here, where z is the atomic number, n is our quantum number, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc., and that's n squared times Planck's constant squared over 4, 4 pi squared, mass of the electron, k, which is Coulomb's constant, z atomic number, and e squared, where e is a charge on an electron. So just by using classical equations for kinetic energy, potential energy, angular momentum, Coulomb's law, Newton's second law, and here's the only difference, Bohr's quantum assumption, the energy of the quantum levels in hydrogen-like atoms is this expression right here. Now in physics, when you get an equation like this, which has a lot of letters, you see if you can simplify it. Well, we can, because most of the terms are constants, right? Planck's constant, 4 pi, mass of the electron, Coulomb's constant, and charge on the electron. We'll combine all those constants into one new constant called the Bohr radius, A sub zero. The Bohr radius is defined as the electron orbital radius for the ground state, where n equals 1, of the hydrogen atom, where z equals 1. Radii of other hydrogen-like atoms, and again, we're reminding you, atoms with only one electron, are expressed as this. See how that simplifies? This equation turns into that. n is the energy level of the electron, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc., and z is the number of protons in the nucleus. And A0 is your Bohr radius, which is right here. And we're not done with our simplification. We had this expression for the energy with all kinds of letters into it. But we'll substitute in the values of the constants there also. And you'll get the energy is minus 13.6 electron volts times z squared over n squared. Now, what does this negative mean over here? That means the electrons are bound in the atom. That's all that means. They're stuck to the atom. The levels get closer together and closer to zero as n increases, right? Because n's in the denominator there. The calculations from Bohr are in excellent agreement with the optical spectra showed earlier, which was explained by people like Rydberg. That still fascinates me, right? This was done in the late 1800s by Rydberg and Lyman and Paschen. And they just found an equation that matched with the data. Now Bohr actually comes up with an exp explanation, a theory, as to why this works. So our next slide will show the various transitions between quantum levels. And they've been named for the physicists who first observed them. The Balmer series of orbital transitions are the only ones that are in the visible spectrum. And we've seen that already. But now we're showing the same thing, matching it up with Bohr. The lowest energy level which is here, n is equal to 1, and that little red dot, that's the nucleus. That's the ground state. The others are excited states. Bohr's model, again, we're going to say it, exactly matched the observed spectra in the experimentally determined equations from Paschen, Balmer, and Lyman using the Rydberg constant. So a transition from, let's see, n equals 4 to n equals 1, Right? That's 486 nanometers. That would be the wavelength of that photon, and that is part of the Balmer series. 
The Bohr model was a critical step in transitioning from the classical view of the world into the new quantum world, in that he used classical equations to explain what was happening at the quantum level. Despite the accuracy of his theory in explaining the hydrogen spectra, he had to make an incredible assumption that violated a well-understood phenomenon of accelerating electric charges, in that they should be radiating energy, and Bohr's solution says, as long as they're in an approved orbit, they are not. Limitations of the Bohr model. The model is applicable only to hydrogen-like atoms, atoms with a single electron. The model is based on an assumption that accelerating charges do not emit electromagnetic radiation if they are in specific orbits. And three, the model predicts the frequency of the photons that are emitted when an electron changes orbits, but does not predict their intensities. More work would now be done by Bohr and many other physicists to transition the explanation of atomic phenomena into a more complete quantum world. Example 1. What is the radius of a hydrogen atom with an electron in the second energy level? We start with n is equal to 2 for the second energy level, z is equal to 1 for hydrogen. We didn't give that, so you can look that up on a periodic table or just realize hydrogen is the first atom. And here's our Bohr radius. We use the equation for the atomic radius, or which is n squared over z times a0, where a0 is the Bohr radius z is equal to 1, so we're left with r is n squared a0, plug in our numbers, and we get the radius is 2.12 times 10 to the minus 11th meters. What is the energy of an electron in the second energy level of a hydrogen atom? n is equal to 2 because we're looking for the second energy level, and z is equal to 1 for hydrogen. So we'll use the equation for the energy levels, which is minus 13.6 electron volts times z squared over n squared. z is equal to 1. So we have the energy is minus 13.6 over n squared. Substitute n equal 2, and we get an energy of negative 3.4 electron volts. How much energy must be absorbed by an electron transitioning from the ground state to the fifth energy level? We'll find the energy of level 1, which we'll call E sub 1, and the energy of level 5, E sub 5. Then subtract to find the change in energy. So if you're going from n equals 1 to n equals 5, you need energy to kick that electron up there. So you need to absorb energy from an outside source. We're using hydrogen, so Z is 1. So we have negative 13.6 EV over n squared. That's their equation for both E1 and E5. Substitute in n equals 1 and n equals 5. And down here, we now have the energy level of each of the orbitals, each of the levels. So we're going to subtract E5 from E1 to get the change in energy or the energy that must be absorbed. So it's E5, that's where we wind up, that's our final state, minus the initial state. So it's a minus 0.54 electron volts minus a minus 13.6 electron volts. And we get a positive change in energy, which means you have to input this energy into the system to kick that electron up. What is the wavelength of the photon emitted when an electron in a hydrogen atom makes the transition from n equals 6 to n equals 2? First, we're going to find the energy levels in the second orbital and the sixth orbital. Then we'll subtract E6 from E2 to find the change in energy. The electron loses energy when it moves to a lower energy state, but where does that energy go? It goes into the photon. So the photon gains the energy, so it will be positive. So here's our general equation for the energy levels for hydrogen atom, right? Z is equal to one, so that falls out of the equation. Here's E2, and here's E6. So the change in energy is minus 3.4 EV minus a minus 0.38 EV. So there's a change in energy there of negative 3.02 EV of the electron. But we want the photon's energy, so that's going to be opposite that. The photon will have an energy of 3.02 electron volts. Continued on the next slide. So the previous slide gives us the energy of the photon so we'll use that energy, and E is equal to hc over lambda to solve for the wavelength of the photon. Since the energy is in electron volts, be sure to use Planck's constant in electron volts also. 
So we solve this for lambda, we get HC over energy, and here's Planck's constant, the version with electron volts. So this will cancel out, seconds will cancel out, we'll be left with meters. So lambda is 4.11 times 10 to the minus 7th meters, or 411 nanometers. Right? We can move the decimal place over 2 to the right, which turns that into 10 to the minus 9 meters. So that would be 411 times 10 to the minus 9 meters. And what's 10 to the minus 9 meter? That's a nanometer. A hypothetical atom has the energy levels that correspond to the following equation. What are the first four energy levels for this atom? Since this problem states hypothetical atom, we don't need to use a formal equation for the energy levels. We'll just use this equation right here. So we have four energy levels, so that's one, two, three, four. Plug them into the equation, ensure you square that each time, and here's our first four energy levels. And can you see how they get closer together the farther away from the nucleus, right? As you go down this way, it's farther away, farther. In the beginning, you went from 48 to 12, so that's what, a difference of 36? Over here, it's a difference of only 2.33 eV. They get closer together the farther away from the nucleus.